Good afternoon. This is Ron Klein. I'm a chairman of Jewish Democrat Council of America, JDCA. We welcome you to our call on a momentous day, Super Tuesday, the first of uh, a number of important dates for the uh, election coming up. Uh, today, we're going to be joined by Haley Seufer, the executive director of JDCA, and special guest Fred Yang, uh, who will, Haley will introduce in just a moment. Um, just by way of introduction, uh, we just want to talk for a minute about uh, the 2020 election. Uh, we know that it's about 250 days away. It seems like an enormous amount of time or maybe a short amount of time for those of you who have been following this election, which has been going on for a couple of years now. But uh, we, we also see that uh, in, in this very different election year from previous presidential election years, we're seeing the acceleration of attacks and acceleration of misinformation that we've never seen before. In particular, as to the things that we watch, uh, we see Republican attempts to misrepresent where Democrats stand on critical issues, including support for Israel. Uh, we want to make sure that informed voters make informed choices on Election Day. That's the mission of JDCA. Uh, and that's why we uh, are conducting these types of community calls. Um, we've done a number of these calls uh, over the last two and a half years. Since our founding, we've established ourselves as the voice of Jewish Democrats, advocating for Jewish and Democrat values in our country. And we support candidates and elected officials who share such values in order to bring about political change. Uh, we not only disseminate information and have these types of calls, but we're going to be active on the ground as we were two years ago in the midterm elections, both endorsing candidates and working to support the election of candidates. We know that Jewish voters will continue to vote Democratic because only the Democratic Party shares our views of issues of importance to our community, such as, in the domestic way, uh, immigration. Uh, we care about gun control, access to affordable health care, and the challenges that uh, the Republicans continue to put on it. Uh, climate change, combating the rise of hatred and bigotry, which has only gotten worse during the last few years, and of course, support for a strong U.S.-Israel relationship and a sensible, consistent foreign policy. Polls like the one that we've observed and you're going to hear about in a few minutes uh, only underscore those facts, and this poll in particular indicates that Jewish voters will support any of the leading Democratic candidates for president over Donald Trump by roughly the same two-to-one margin. I'm now going to turn it over to Haley Seufer to briefly describe the findings of the poll from the perspective of JDCA before handing it over to uh, Fred. And the last point I'll make is uh, if you want to learn more about us uh, or support us financially and otherwise or get involved with us, go to our website, www.jewishdems.org. That's jewishdems.org. And with that, I'll turn it over to Haley. Thank you, Ron. On behalf of the Nonpartisan Jewish Electorate Institute, Garen Hart Yang, here today represented by Fred Yang, conducted an online survey last week of just over a thousand voters nationally who self-identified as Jewish and indicated they were likely to vote in the 2020 election. The poll results demonstrate that an overwhelming majority of Jewish voters are pro-Israel Democrats and that Jewish voters overwhelmingly disapprove of President Trump. In particular, a majority of Jewish voters disapprove of President Trump's handling of nearly every domestic policy issue, and they're going to take that disapproval right to the polls in November. One of the biggest takeaways of this poll is that Jewish voters will support any of the Democratic candidates, including all the leading Democratic candidates remaining in the race, at more than a two to one margin. And interestingly, there's not a discernible difference when it comes to Jewish support for any of the candidates when polled against Donald Trump. We also see from the poll that Jews are voting largely on domestic policy issues. This has been consistent over time. Israel, while very important to Jewish voters, and over 90% identify as pro-Israel, according to this poll, is not ultimately driving the Jewish vote. What has changed over time is that Jews are now also voting on their own perceived sense of insecurity, given the rise of anti-Semitism. And for that, they put most of the blame on Donald Trump for contributing to the rise of white nationalism in our country and believe the way to make our community more secure is to elect those people who share our values. 
We are fortunate today to have with us the person who conducted this poll, Fred Yang. Fred, is, Fred has achieved a reputation per, for providing insightful analysis in his approach to political survey research and is a regular contributor to network and cable television programs that you've probably seen, such as MSNBC, uh, MTP Daily, and he's been a part of the NBC News coverage of the national election return since 2008. As mentioned, he is one of the leading pollsters at the Garen Hart Yang firm, and he conducted this poll. So Fred, we look forward to hearing from you. Before we turn it over to you though, I want to remind everyone on the call that all lines are muted, but to please send your questions for Fred to info at jewishdems.org -E and we will have an opportunity to, uh, to pose them to Fred toward the end of the call. So over to you, Fred, thank you. Thank, uh, thank you very much, um, Haley and Mr. Klein. It's been um, an honor and a pleasure. So with that, um, I, if you'll indulge me for a couple of minutes, let me sort of um, do a little bit deeper dive uh, on the poll numbers um, that Haley and Mr. Klein uh, talked about. Uh, as uh, Haley said in our intro, um, the poll results uh, I'm going to talk about um, are very fresh. We were in the field um, February 18th to 24, uh, 1,001 um, likely um, voters who self-identified as Jewish and said they would vote in the November 2020 election. The margin of error um, for the overall sample is plus or minus 3.1%. And um, I feel very comfortable and confident that the sample is representative of Jewish Americans um, by region, by age, uh, by education status, uh, by partisanship, and also uh, by religious um, identification. Uh, a couple big picture points, um, some of which may mirror um, what Haley and Mr. Klein said so eloquently, and others of which are sort of nuances um, from my um, digging deeper in the poll results. Uh, first point is, and I really like the way, again, Haley said at the beginning, um, American Jews are pro-Israel Democrats. So um, one, of the, one of the questions asked in polls, and um, these were asked in JEI polls in 2019 and 2018, is which party do you self-identify with? Uh, in certain states in America, like California and North Carolina, um, you, can re you register by party. In a lot of other states, uh, Virginia, uh, Minnesota, uh, Missouri, you self-identify. Uh, in our survey uh, nationally, party self-identification is 66% Democrat, 26% Republican, and the remaining 8% um, are independent or not sure. So we basically, we have 66% of um, Jewish Americans who say they're Democrats. That compares to 65% in 2019 and 68% in 2018. Um, this is um, an electorate that is heavily Democratic. A related point um, that Haley said is that these are pro-Israel Democrats. So not only are two-thirds of the Jewish voters we sampled self-identify as Democrats, um, we had 91% um, of voters in our survey who characterized um, their personal um, uh, views as being generally pro-Israel. 91% of Jewish Americans in the current survey said that they were pro-Israel compared to 88% in 2019 and 91% in 2018. Again, um, extremely strong and stable numbers. Um, it doesn't mean, um, however, that just because um, American Jews are pro-Israel that they are necessarily 100% um, supportive of the Israeli government's policies. We did find that 35% of American Jews that they were generally supportive of Israeli policies. Another 56% said that they were critical uh, of some um, of the government's policies. But again, um, heavily democratic and overwhelmingly pro-Israel. The other commonality of our sample shares, and this is, shouldn't be a surprise because it relates to partisanship, 
is extreme disapproval toward President Trump. Um, President Trump's disapproval rating uh, in the current survey for his performance as president is 68% disapprove. That compares to 71% approve and 75% disapprove in 2018. So again, 68% um, of American Jews disapprove of President Trump's um, performance right now uh, compared to only 28% who, who approve. Um, that is a consistent um, anti-President Trump um, number. Um, I know a lot of you are interested in um, cross-tabs. Um, there are other questions I can do this for, but I did think um, laying out um, some of the numbers um, for the president among certain sectors of the electorate would be useful. So among um, uh, uh, Jewish men, President Trump has a 34% approval rating. Among Jewish women, President Trump approval rating is 23%, so an 11-point gender gap. Um, Jews who are aged 18 to 29, 22% approve to President Trump. Jews who are aged 65 plus, 23% um, approve of President Trump. And also um, by a denomination, um, conservative Jews, 33% approve. Reform Jews, 19% approve. Orthodox Jews, um, now they're, they're about 8% of the total Jewish electorate, so they're not a huge group. But Orthodox Jews, 60% uh, approve, 39% disapprove. Um, there are two um, subgroups in the Jewish electorate that give President Trump um, solidly favorable numbers. One group, obviously, would be Republican Jews. Um, they give President Trump a very strong rating. The second group, again, are Orthodox Jews, 60% approve of President Trump. However, um, two years ago, in a similar survey conducted for JEI, President Trump's approval rating with Orthodox Jews was at 68%. So um, his approval rating with Orthodox Jews, while still high, relatively speaking, actually has gone down eight points um, over the course of a couple years. Um, I really like, um, again, the way that um, Mr. Klein and Haley characterize um, how Jewish voters are approaching the 2020 presidential election, which is uniformly um, pro-democratic and voting against President Trump. There are a couple ways we measured this. Um, when we matched a generic Democrat, and all that means is we said, who, who would you vote for president? a Democratic candidate for President Trump, the Democratic candidate is ahead 67-28. Then um, at the time we did the poll, there were several people who were still running. Um, then we uh, matched President Trump against the six leading Democratic contenders at the point we polled a couple weeks ago. Um, Biden was beating Trump 67-31. Sanders was beating Trump 65-30. Bloomberg was beating Trump 67-28. Bobashar was beating Trump 66-30. Mayor Buttigieg was beating Trump 69-31. And Senator Warren was beating Trump 65-32. Um, given the margin of error, um, the fair reading of these numbers, which ranges for 65% for Warren and Sanders against Trump, the 69% um, for Buttigieg, is that the, the Jewish electorate is roughly voting for these six leading Democrats at roughly the same margin. Moreover, um, what is even more interesting about these numbers, and again, um, I know I can be a little pedantic and wordy, the bottom line is um, Jewish Americans are voting for um, Democratic candidates at roughly the same two to one or more than two to one margin, is that it doesn't seem to matter how they feel about the candidates individually. If it's a Democrat versus Trump, they will vote for them in very strong numbers. So um, the most, the, the Democratic candidate with the best image among Jewish Americans um, was Mayor Buttigieg. He was a 60 positive, 28 negative, and he was getting 69% of the Jewish vote against Trump. The most polarizing candidate um, among Jewish Americans 
was Senator Sanders at 52 favorable and 45 unfavorable, but he was getting 65% of the vote against President Trump. And again, to mirror what um, Haley and Mr. Klein were saying, um, yes, there may be issues with individual Democratic candidates among the electorate, but when it comes down to a Democrat versus President Trump, a, an overwhelming majority of Jewish Americans, um, at least two-thirds, if not higher, um, are united in their desire um, to vote for Democrats, and I guess equally important um, to vote against President Trump. Um, just like past surveys of Jewish Americans, um, their issue agenda is predominantly focused on domestic issues. Uh, when we asked um, voters um, what are the most important issues um, for, for themselves when selecting a candidate, 90% um, um, rated health care as important, 88% rated Medicare and Social Security as important, 87% rated the economy and jobs as important, 85% um, rated gun safety as important. Um, um, no surprise to any of you who are following politics, those are the issues of the day, health care, economy, gun safety. Um, I will say um, two issues of special interest um, to Jewish Americans. 68% um, rated Israel um, as an important issue. So, um, again, I know um, it's hard to sometimes see numbers when I'm reading them. 90% of Jewish Americans mentioned health care um, as an important issue. 68% mentioned Israel. It's not that Israel is unimportant as an issue, but clearly health care, Social Security, the economy, and gun safety are more important right now and by bigger margins than Israel. But the other um, particular issue to Jewish Americans um, that's important is actually rising anti-Semitism. And we find 86% um, um, of Jewish Americans saying that is an important issue to them when thinking about selecting a candidate in the 2020 um, election. And um, just I want to, I know there are a bunch of other questions. Um, there are lots of other interesting poll numbers, which I could go on and on and on for. I just want to end on um, the point about um, anti-Semitism and um, how um, the electorate feels about that. Um, first of all, um, we asked two questions about um, safety. Um, when we asked our sample um, about uh, compared to a couple, two, two years ago or so, do you feel um, that Jews in America are more or less secure? 68% of the voters we sampled said Jews in America, America are less secure. Um, only 6% said more secure. So again, two thirds of voters in our sample said Jews in America are less secure than they were two years ago. And then we asked a question a little closer to home. Compared to two years ago, as a Jewish American, do you feel more secure or less secure? And by 58 to seven, um, our voters told us that they themselves as Jewish Americans felt less secure. Um, we asked um, this, um, our voters, um, uh, who is to blame? Uh, two questions related to that. 56% uh, of the voters we surveyed said President Trump um, bared at least some responsibility for the targeted attacks on synagogues in recent years, including those in Pittsburgh and Poway. So 56% said yes, President Trump is at least partially responsible. Um, we, uh, we, we, we read four different actors and ask who contributes the most to emboldening anti-Semitism in the United States. 34% selected the far right and white nationalists. 29% selected President Trump. 24% selected left-leaning members of Congress. And 4% selected the Republican Party. So again, 34% selected far right wing and white nationalists. And 29% selected um, President Trump. Finally, um, related to this issue, um, we asked our voters again, which one or two of the following would be the best way for individuals or communities 
to help secure, to help improve the security of Jews in the United States. 43% said, uh, 44% said we should help people with the right values get elected. 44% said we should work to get Donald Trump out of office. In this election year, the top two answers were electing people with the right values and getting Donald Trump out of office. I think it's fair to say um, that Jewish Americans, again, the overwhelming majority of whom are Democrats, are very politically activated. Um, we had 29% um, who said um, a good way to help improve the security of Jews is to press Democrats to condemn anti-Semitism. And then we had 33%, you were allowed to pick more than one reason. We had 33% who said um, that we should add security to Jewish institutions and places of worship. Um, I wanna end here because the previous three um, um, results I read, help people with the right values get elected, work to get President Trump out of office, press Democrats and condemn anti-Semitism. The results to those three items in this survey were virtually the same a year ago. However, on the item of adding security to Jewish institutions and places of worship, 12% selected that in 2019. That number rose to 33%. And I know um, I'm looking forward to um, I'm answering or trying to answer a lot of your questions. Um, I wouldn't say that's a surprising result, um, adding security to Jewish institutions and places of worship. That, did, that didn't surprise me necessarily, but it was, um, it was a, a sad result and I guess does tell us a lot um, about where the, where the country feels like it is um, uh, overall and especially related uh, to security of Jewish Americans. Um, with that, um, Haley and uh, Mr. Klein, I'm, I'm happy to um, um, answer questions. Great, thank you so much, Fred. Um, well, I'm glad you ended it by saying that, you know, sadly that those responses at the end there did not surprise you, but our first question is actually related to surprises, um, and it is as follows. Uh, was there anything in this poll that surprised you in terms of the results? Well, I would say um, there are two kinds of surprises, unexpected surprises and pleasant surprises. I would say that the two surprises to me, um, Haley and everyone, was number one, it surprised me in an odd way, the stability of the results. Um, that 91%, for example, of, of our respondents um, said that they were pro-Israel. Uh, and again, in 2019, that was 88 in 2018, it was 91. Those are stable results. Uh, the party ID, that um, basically the same proportion of Jewish Americans self-identify of Democrats now as they did in 19 and 18. Um, just, um, and I know um, maybe that's a weird, a weird thing to be surprised about, Haley, but again, pollsters are, are kind of nerdy people. Um, I, I was pleasantly surprised at the stability um, of the results. I would say the other surprise to me, and again, it's something that you mentioned at the beginning, and I, I, I Mr. Klein mentioned and I talked about, is, look, it doesn't matter um, how um, voters feel about the, and again, when we polled, there were six Democratic candidates. Um, it didn't matter um, how they felt about, you know, a Klobuchar or a Bloomberg or Sanders. They voted um, for each of the six candidates, again, and roughly um, the same strong level. I would say the real surprise to me um, was, for example, um, when we do our feeling thermometer, um, folks, we not only ask, are you favorable or unfavorable, we ask name ID. And when we polled, um, you know, about 10 days ago, 93% of Jewish Americans had an opinion of Amy Klobuchar. And that is just an extremely high level of name ID. Look, I know she ran for president. She ran a national campaign. Uh, personal aside, she was a client of mine. But that's still a really high um, name ID. And I think um, it just reinforces the point I made a little earlier, Haley, that um, Jewish Americans um, in particular um, seem very energized, um, very um, activated, 
and very on top of things that are political. Great. Uh, we have a question from Dr. Sheskin at the University of Miami. He is asking, how were Jews identified in the poll? Um, how was I identified? How, how were Jews identified? How did they identify themselves as Jews in the poll? Oh, okay. Uh, sorry. Thank you. So um, when we, um, um, we uh, contacted um, our, our sample um, by email and text, and the first question was, are you currently register registered to vote? And the second question was, regardless how, of how often you attend services, you consider yourself Protestant, Catholic, Jewish, or something else. And then um, if you were, if you self-identified as Jewish, um, you continued with the survey. Great, okay. Um, we have another question about the specifics of the poll, and that is the margin of error. So you have indicated this has a 3.5% margin of error. What does that mean exactly? And similarly, in a related note, compared to 2016, where Donald Trump nationally got 24% of the Jewish vote based on exit mm -hmm. polling, is Jewish support for Trump in 2020 within the margin of error compared to those 2016 numbers? Um, very good question. Um, uh, answer to, to part one is that the margin of error means that um, in 19 out of 20 cases uh, that the um, that a result that is 50 50 will be 53 47 either way okay that that's that's the that's the range that that the worst it would be is 53 47 yes or 53 47 no um, for a survey with 1,000 interviews like our survey had. Surveys um, with fewer interviews, 800 or 600, would obviously have a higher margin of error for each question. Um, I hope, I, I know that's not um, uh, extremely uh, substantive, but um, then I'd have to subject everyone to 33 years of polling 101 as I've been doing for 33 years. That's basically the margin of error. It's a factor of, um, it's a factor of the number of interviews and also it's a factor of the results. On questions that are like 90 to 10, obviously th there'll be, um, the margin of error um, will be less relevant because the results are so decisive. Part two, okay, let's take the issue of um, President Trump's support because I know um, since um, the poll was released, there's been a lot of back and forth on that. So according to the exit polls, um, and again, let's be very clear, um, ladies and gentlemen, exit poll is still a poll. Exit polls are very accurate, but they're still polls. So the 24, and they're also subject to the same margin of error as normal polls. But let's just say that we know for a fact that President Trump's support um, among Jewish Americans in 2018, 2016 was 24%. And again, I won't quibble over whether that was within the margin of error. Um, President Trump against a generic Democrat in our survey got 28%. Let's just take that number. He gets 28% against a generic uh, um, Democrat. Uh, President Trump gets 28% against Mayor Bloomberg. Um, that's the that's the worst Trump number. I w ar arguably the 28% that Trump gets right now with against a Democrat is probably a little bit beyond the margin of error. Okay, it's right on the cuff. Now um, I would say um, as a pollster um, who happens to be a Democrat but I'm a pollster, which is more important than being a Democrat, I would say two things about the, the number for President Trump. First of all, the exit poll number for President Trump in the 2016 election was the election result in November of 2016. We are, um, and at least when the poll was taken, we were in late February. 
uh, the Democratic candidates. Um, I would argue, um, and I don't might not feel like this to people. I would argue that um, while our primary um, has been fairly tame, most of the focus of the Democrats, reasonably, because they're trying to win a primary, has been on each other, and hasn't been on making the case against Donald Trump. Um, I would say that if Republicans are pointing to our results and saying, oh, my gosh, Trump was getting 24% in 2016, and now he's getting 28% in 2020, um, he's, he's on a comeback or he's turning things around, um, I, I would say that um, they should be looking at other numbers and other factors to give them comfort. Um, I, I would, let me put it to you this way. What do we think, um, given where we are as a country, and given we still have nine more months to general election, what do we think is the more likely outcome? That President Trump's 28% is going to grow or that it will shrink back to 2016? I would argue that the latter is probably more likely. Great. Um, we have a question from Daniel in Illinois. Um, he's wondering if you measured enthusiasm for particular candidates or whether they would the uh, those taking the survey would just vote for those candidates versus Trump. That's an excellent question, um, Daniel. I would say um, we did not we did not directly ask how enthusiastic um, you are about um, voting for whether it's Biden or Sanders or Klobuchar. So we did not ask, are you excited or not about voting for the candidate? I would say um, that the other way, however, of answering that very good question is, um, you know, so when we do our trial heats, and you wouldn't know this because you've only heard me, when we do our trial heats, um, and I'll just, I'll pick someone who dropped out so there's no bias, and um, I'm only picking her because I also work for her. When we're doing a trial heat between Amy Klobuchar and Donald Trump, we, we ask, are you going to vote for Klobuchar, the Democrat, or Trump, the Republican? Given, again, that this poll was taken almost eight months before the election, um, and it's a poll um, and not a ballot, a reasonable answer for a person would be, I'm not sure, because the election is eight weeks, eight months away. So um, what, what I look at um, as a pollster, if we don't ask how enthusiastic are you about a candidate, I look at the number, the first committed number, right? Because I ask Klobuchar or Trump, and then um, Haley could be, I'm not sure. And then I would follow up and say, okay, Haley, well, um, we know you're not sure, but if you had to lean today, who would you lean to, Klobuchar or Trump? Here is the um, first first answer to who you're going to vote for, which I think tells you a little bit more about the um, enthusiasm. And then, again, this is not the lean app ask, the second ask. This is, this is the answer to the first ask. Biden, 66. Sanders, 62. Bloomberg, 65. Klobuchar, 64. Buttigieg, 69. Warren, 63. Those are very strong numbers, um, eight months for the election. And again, I won't bore you with all the different numbers. Um, Jewish Americans have, um, you know, feel differently about each candidate, some more popular than others, Biden, Buttigieg. But um, what's impressive is the high level of commitment in the first ask, which I do think, Daniel, while not, while not 100% responsive to your very good question, I do think um, at the margins um, and tangentially does tell us that um, Jewish Americans are very enthusiastic about voting against Donald Trump for a Democrat. So that, that question, uh, that answer is similar to our next question, which also comes from Illinois. Steve in Illinois has asked, how do Jewish voting patterns compare to other constituencies within the Democratic Party and within the American electorate? Um, I would say that... Um, you know, that's, uh, again, um, Stephen, very good question. I would say that in some respects, um, you know, we could talk about, uh, you know, pre-2016 and post-2016. I would say that the patterns of Jewish Americans, um, you know, 
you know, mirror, you know, at a slightly lower level, um, the level of support for Democratic candidates, um, you know, that, um, for example, African Americans uh, and Latinx voters show. Uh, I think Jewish Americans um, seem to be more and more, and I know we try to be nonpartisan too, but you just got to face the facts. Jewish Americans seem to be more and more um, focused on sort of landing um, in the Democratic um, in the Democratic column. I would say that um, since President Trump got elected, that um, in addition to African Americans. Latinx voters and Jewish Americans sort of becoming more solidified for Democrats. The other demographic group we're seeing change a lot um, are suburban um, college-educated women. Um, they are uh, more and more sort of um, turning away from Republicans and going to, um, to, to Democratic candidates. Um, that's, for example, a, a big reason, along with um, Jews, African Americans, and Latinx voters, for why we took the House back in 2018, but that certainly was fueled by college-educated um, women in the suburbs. One sort of big-picture point, um, Haley, I want to make, and I know, um, uh, you know, we're 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 in the era now where um, every minute seems important, and it is. But um, there's going to be a point um, in our country when there is not a President Trump, and I think as a political analyst, um, one of the questions I ask is um, what happened to the Republican Party and what happens to some of these core Democratic groups like Jewish Americans and like suburban women that have sort of drifted away from Republicans more to Democrats? What happens to these groups when um, Donald Trump is no longer a political force? Um, and I know it's very rude and obnoxious to answer my own question, I do think um, it seems like when you look at a lot of the Republican um, office holders that they have decided um, that actually the, the GOP is not the Republican Party. It's the party of Donald Trump. And as long as that holds sway, I do think it will, it seems to be, it will be harder for Republicans to get votes outside the Republican base, even after President Trump is no longer president. Great. Well, we have we have two questions specifically about polls from Sam in Baltimore. The first is um, none of the major polling firms predicted Donald Trump would win the Electoral College vote in 2016. Uh, how did the pollsters get it wrong and how much faith should we have in polls in general? And then the second related question is when we read a poll such as this one, what should we, as non-experts in polling, but as concerned citizens, focus on the most? What are the biggest takeaways here for us? Okay, um, excellent questions. Um, though I will say, I, I'm not sure what I ever did to Sam because I don't know him. No, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> I would say, um, I would say that's actually one of the um, myths from the 2016 campaign. So um, let me back up, and I know I tend to be a little verbose. I'll try to be very uh, succinct. Um, when 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 um, you add up the polling averages of the last week's polls in 2016, the average polls um, had Hillary Clinton winning the popular vote by about three and a half points. She won the popular vote in real life by 2.7, but she lost the presidency. And I think um, Sam, one of the answers to the question is actually in the body of your question, which is um, national polls um, poll the, the people. So every person is counted equally, and it's not based on the electoral college map. It's just sort of um, in America today, um, how many would vote for Trump, how many would vote for Clinton. Um, and actually, um, and I'm, not, I'm trying not to be too defensive, um, polling in 2016, um, in, in general, was as accurate as it had ever been. Again, borne out by the fact that um, if you added up the public polls in the last week, they were pretty close to what Hillary Clinton got in the popular vote against Donald Trump. But again, we don't elect our presidents um, by who gets the most votes. We elect our presidents, obviously, um, as Sam put in his question, by the Electoral College. And this is where polling was off. 
is polling was off in the three states where Trump won the election and Clinton lost, Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. And part of the reason why the polling was off was there weren't as many polls taken in those three states as they were nationally. Um, and I know um, this next point may be a little bit too arcane and small, but most of the news organizations, um, when they do polling, they want national polls. I mean, if you're NBC or CBS or CNN or, or Fox, when you report on elections, you tend to report on the country, which makes sense. Um, there were many polls nationally in 2016. There were fewer polls in these swing states. And that's where um, Sam and everyone, the analysts, and actually the uh, campaign staffers were misled. We just didn't have enough polls and obviously none of good polls in Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania. And that's where um, the, you know, President Trump's victory in the Electoral College um, came about. And, um, you know, um, we were misled um, by um, the lack of polls in those three states. Um, Okay, finally, a bigger picture question. Um, how should um, a concerned citizen um, read polls? And I guess, Haley, um, how should a concerned citizen um, read our poll? I think the first thing you should, you should, you should be aware of is um, how many people um, did the polling firm interview? Um, and again, we interviewed 1,001 likely voters. And what was the polling firm interviewing? Our poll was of Jewish Americans nationally, okay? If you're doing, if you are reading a poll in the paper or online or whatnot, and it's supposed to be a poll about the country, it should have at least 800 interviews, a minimum of 800 interviews to be credible and to have a low margin of error. The second thing you want to look at, and I know these seem very detail oriented, but um, a, a lot, believe me, ladies and gentlemen, of having done this for 33 years, a lot of what goes into a good poll or bad poll, poll are about the details. The second thing you want to look at is uh, when was the poll taken? Okay. Um, and our poll was taken between the 18th and the 24th. There was recently a very, a poll, a poll done by a credible organization for a primary that polled from February 3rd to February 24th, okay? So this was for a primary, um, a presidential primary, I think in the state of Virginia. It doesn't matter. I remember the dates. Here's the problem with that, okay? February 3rd was the Iowa caucus. February 20th was Nevada. In between Iowa and Nevada was New Hampshire, okay? So this is a poll that's trying to tell us what Virginia is going to do on Super Tuesday. It started on the night of Iowa and ended two days after Nevada. As you all know, there has been an ebb and flow in this election every day. Um, you don't know what this poll is measuring because it was in the field for so long. Um, you want to make sure that when you look at a poll, it's a snapshot in time. It shouldn't be um, in the field or it shouldn't be, um, you know, polled for more than three to five days. And the final thing you want to look at when you look at the poll is if you can't look at the questions. And, um, you know, you want to make sure that the questions um, mean what they say. So, for example, um, when you look at our poll, and, you know, um, I, I talk, and Haley and Mr. Klein have talked a lot about how well Democrats are doing. Um, if you see our poll questions, you will see they are fair and down the middle. Thinking about the general election of president, um, would you vote for Democrat Michael Bloomberg or Republican Donald Trump? It doesn't get any more basic than that. So when you see Bloomberg 67, Trump 28, you know that's a fair number. There are other poll and other poll questions that would add information, either positive or negative for Bloomberg or Trump. That's legitimate. There's nothing wrong with putting misleading items in a poll question as long as, A, the pollster or the organization discloses it asks that kind of information. And then so, therefore, B, you as a consumer 
uh, can judge the results that way. So again, um, how many interviews, um, when was the poll taken, and most importantly, um, what, how were the questions worded? And if they were worded um, you know, unfairly, does the organization disclose it? Again, um, folks, it is a legitimate practice to ask a negative question about President Trump or a positive question. That would certainly impact how people feel about the president. You just need to disclose, A, that you did it, and B, you should disclose what information you actually um, read to voters. Great. Um, our next question comes from Sarah in D.C. Uh, given that it is Super Tuesday, um, what do these results tell us about the Jewish vote in down-ballot races, so particularly Senate and House races as well? Um, I think it tells us that um, that there's going to be very little daylight between the vote for the Democratic candidate for president and a vote for a Democratic candidate um, for the U.S. Senate um, or the House. Um, one of the one of um, one way I judge that is uh, again I know this seems um, like a, a little bit of a minor detail. Again, we ask. Um, respondents in our survey, um, how do you think of yourself as? And again, 66% said they were Democrat, and 26% said they were Republican. So that's a 40-point Democratic advantage. Um, you know, Trump versus a Democrat was 67-28, which is a 39-point advantage. This tells me that the, the, that the Jewish Americans we interviewed are not only Democratic, that they are um, voting for the Democrat. And um, there are two um, factors um, in American politics that would, if, if you only could know two things, um, it would tell you um, the results of election. One is race, and the second is partisanship. Um, Democrats, especially in federal races, vote for Democrats. Republicans vote for Republicans, independent split. The fact that um, the 66% of Jewish Americans in our survey who said they were Democrat translated to 67% who would vote for the Democrat against Trump gives me a, a fair amount of confidence that that number would be similar if it was a Democratic candidate for Congress versus the Republican or the Democratic candidate for Senate versus the Republican candidate for Senate. Great. Well, that, that seems like a very good place to end this call uh, on that positive note uh, from, from our perspective, at least that of JDCA. Um, so I will turn it back over to JDCA's chair, Ron Klein, to wrap it up. And thank you so much to Fred for lending your expertise and analysis on this call. Over to Ron. Um, still might be muted. All right. Well, I will end the call then and just say on behalf of the Jewish Democratic Council of America, we are extremely grateful uh, to all of you who have joined the call. Uh, please do uh, follow our work online, on social media, um, sign up to get our weekly newsletters at jewishdems.org. And uh, please do follow what we're doing because we are, we are there to serve as a resource to all of you and continue to inform the public about, uh, about the Jewish vote and about public opinion, especially when it comes to refuting the false narrative that may be out there about how Jews vote. So thank you so much and have a good afternoon. Thank you to Fred. Thank you, Haley. Bye -bye. Thank you, everyone.